All right, um, we'll get started now and uh, people can join as they come in. Um, so my name is Claire Harris. I'm a nephrologist at Vancouver General Hospital. Um, and we're going to talk in this lunch webinar about proteinuria with a focus on uh, management uh, as it relates to primary care. Uh, I believe that you can ask questions using the um, type in questions, but if you have questions after the fact, feel free to email me. My email is listed here and this uh, session I believe will be recorded. So I have no disclosures, uh, no relationships with commercial interests, uh, no conflicts of interest to report, no financial support or potential conflicts of interest there, um, and no real mention of mitigating any potential biases. There is none apart from being a nephrologist. So we're gonna talk today about uh, the ways to measure proteinuria the most common causes of proteinuria and what are the indications for nephrology referral. We're going to recognize that proteinuria is associated with an increased risk of death and kidney failure and discuss the treatment of patients with proteinuria to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events and renal failure. Uh, and then I think probably most useful to you all to review some common pitfalls in the diagnosis and management of proteinuria as it relates in particular to primary care. So first of all, how much of, is normal? What's the normal range? So it is normal to have a small amount of protein in the urine. Small proteins like immunoglobulins and beta-2 microglobulins are freely filtered by the glomerulus and then reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. So most of the protein that's in urine normal Normally, are small proteins, not albumin. But we say, based on observational studies, that normal uh, protein excretion is less than 150 milligrams per day of total protein and less than 30 milligrams per day of, of albumin. That being said, most patients or healthy patients that you test will fall well below that reported range, and, and so it's probably um, not normal to be on the edge of the range. Importantly, for uh, primary care, transient proteinuria is very common, so abnormal findings should always be confirmed with a repeat measurement before labeling someone as having proteinuria. So I thought it would be worthwhile to go over some of the pathophysiology. So there are generally four groups or classes of proteinuria in terms of the etiology. The first is glomerular, which means that there's damage to the filter of the membrane of the glomerulus causing leakage of proteins that wouldn't normally make it into the urine in much quantities. And this is really a marker of glomerular disease and can be seen most commonly in diabetes, but also in glomerular nephritis like lupus nephritis or minimal change disease where you basically think of it as a leaky sieve um, where all proteins and especially albumin gets through that wouldn't normally get through. And you can see quite high degrees of proteinuria in this range. The second category is overflow, and that's when you have the normal proteins that are normally filtered uh, into the area of the proximal tubule that overwhelm the capacity of the kidney. So basically the filtered load is more than the reabsorptive capacity, so you end up with those small proteins in the urine. So the best example of this is light chain. So in myeloma, you have the production of immunoglobulins and, and light chains um, that are produced in very, very large quantities. These get filtered and then they can't be reabsorbed completely, so they end up in the urine. There's many other examples of this, like myoglobin and rhabdomyolysis, and in leukemia as well. And then tubulo interstitial. This either means that there's damage to the tubule so that you can't reabsorb protein you normally would, or that you have increased excretion of proteins. This can happen in acute interstitial nephritis, in ATN, in Fanconi syndrome, which is a proximal tubulopathy, or from toxins, things like heavy metals, certain medications, um, and this is another common cause. Then there's always an other category. So this is just everything else. And another way to think about this is the physiologic causes of proteinuria. These typically are either transient, so something like exercise should be vigorous, fever, heart failure, severe hypertension, like malignant hypertension that's acute, 
or urinary tract infections can cause transient proteinuria, where when you repeat it the next time in the absence of these insults, they should be gone. Orthostatic proteinuria is kind of a special case that's in particular seen in peds, uh, and we can talk about it more later if we have time. Generally, if there's not a lot of proteinuria, it could be from any of these categories, but if there's a lot, it's typically glomerular or overflow. So what are the best ways to test for it? So we have the simple urinalysis, which you're all familiar with, or urine dipstick, which is cheap and easy and quick. And the benefit of it is that you can detect other urinary abnormalities like signs of, of a bladder infection, signs of hematuria or glucosuria, and that can be helpful. The downsides is that it primarily detects albumin and is concentration dependent. So depending on how concentrated the urine is or the specific gravity, you may get varying results. So it is important to look at that. It's really only semi-quantitative and you might think of it as more of a qualitative measure. And remember about false positives, things like recent contrast administration, having a high pH in the urine. There's lots of things, and again, that, that would be another reason to repeat things later. And it really isn't sensitive. So in terms of screening for patients for proteinuria and albuminuria, such as in diabetes, as you all know, it's not very helpful because it only gets positive when you get more than 300 milligrams of albumin, which is equivalent to an ACR of about 30. The urine ACR albumin to creatinine ratio you're all familiar with is much more sensitive, can detect small amounts of albumin, but it only detects albumin. So it's not able to tell you about other things like light chains when I mentioned overflow. So if you see a urine ACR and PCR and they're quite discrepant, then that could actually be useful to let you know if the PCR is much higher than the ACR. We take that as a signal that there's another protein there. And we also kind of call the PCR as the cheap and dirty UPEP or urine protein leptophoresis. So the PCR can also be done. It detects all proteins and is used more in certain populations and actually in certain countries more than others. Some of the times you might be familiar with seeing it is in pediatrics or in pregnancy, but it's less validated in the screening of diabetic nephropathy because we really think the albumin is the most important factor in that setting. So it has not being stressed in guideline recommendations. The 24-hour urine protein is something we commonly do in nephrology but isn't done very often in primary care. We do think of it as the gold standard with a big caveat that it is only accurate if it's done correctly and it's often not. But we find it useful for guiding treatments uh, of GN and, and other diseases where we really need to know exactly how much protein there is, especially on the higher end. The problem obviously is that it's inconvenient, it's often done incorrectly, and it's important to always do a urine creatinine at the same time as there are standardized amounts of creatinine secretion based on age and gender that, that can help validate whether it's an over or under collection. So the spot assays are most likely what you're gonna be doing, so the ACRs and the PCRs. So spot assays also have their problems, so they're vulnerable to fluctuations based on circadian rhythms, day-to-day -day variation, postural changes, and physiologic factors. So it is useful to do early morning samples if you can, um, but any sample is okay. It's also just good to know that there's going to be some variability between measurements. So we have to be careful not to over-interpret small changes. So an example that I often give is that urine ACR that increases from 4.5 to 9 probably doesn't represent a doubling of proteinuria, but patients get quite worried about that. So it's important to look at a trend over time and not interpret small changes. So a change from 4.5 to 9 may not be significant, but a change from 4.5 to 45 is of course significant. As I mentioned before, the accuracy of proteinuria quantification using these spot assays is limited at the higher ranges. So if you have a urine ECR of 400 versus 500, it's really hard to say if that's a different value or not. The other thing to remember is that they, it is a ratio between albumin to creatinine. So if you have uh, you know, an extreme of creatinine secretion or excretion, like you have very low or very high muscle mass, that ratio will be distorted. And so you'll get either over or underestimation of proteinuria with an ECR. And 
So for those reasons and others, there's still a role for 24-hour urine protein, but usually not in primary care. Although we wouldn't mind it if you did it because it would save us some time, but don't feel that you have to. So proteinuria terminology, as you probably know, has changed over time. Although to be honest, uh, in nephrology, we often aren't always using the most up-to-date terms, uh, but you're in ACR between three and 30 in the SI units, which is milligram per millimole, is considered moderately increased albuminuria. It used to be called microalbuminuria, and it correlates to about 10 times that, so 30 to 300 milligrams per day, where urine ACR over 30 used to be called macroalbuminuria, but is now called severely increased albuminuria or overt proteinuria. That worries some people, the, the idea of severely increased and may increase the anxiety around albuminuria, but some of that is good because we do really need to worry about these patients. And this kind of degree would correlate to over 300 milligrams per day, which is interesting to note, that's the level at which the dipstick usually becomes positive. Whereas nephrotic range proteinuria, we're thinking of over three to three and a half grams on a 24 hour urine protein, which is roughly ACR values of 300 or above. But again, as I said, it's not that accurate in that range. So in terms of the common causes of proteinuria, I do want to emphasize transient proteinuria as a common cause that would be seen in primary care. But diabetic nephropathy is by far and above the most common cause of proteinuria that's seen in primary care. Other systemic diseases are another common cause. So patients that have lupus, myeloma, amyloid can also have proteinuria related to glomerular or overflow causes. And in nephrology, we see a lot of patients with secondary FSGS lesions. You can just think of this as basically scarring from either hyperfiltration or some kind of an adaptive response to a previous injury. So patients with hypertension, patients with obesity, uh, who've had prior nephrectomies, prior reflux in pediatrics, the list is actually very long. Sometimes you'll see us say that, you know, the proteinuria we think is from secondary FSGS or proteinuria from hypertension. When we think of hypertensive kidney disease, we often think of it as not having proteinuria, but when there's a maladaptive response, we can see proteinuria. Primary glomerular lesion, lesions are obviously much less common, but we do see them. So minimal change disease, membranoproliferative glomerular nephritis, membranous nephropathy, primary FSGS, IgA nephropathy is one of the most common causes of glomerular disease worldwide. And you can think of it more in younger patients and patients with Asian backgrounds or Hispanic backgrounds, ANCA and post-infectious or what used to be called post-strep GN. Again, much, much less common. Pregnancy related, and again, that's a whole nother talk. Structural kidney disease, you can also see proteinuria, which is why we always do an ultrasound, pretty much no matter what in nephrology, is even if you have preserved kidney function, signs of albuminuria, in some cases is related to structural kidney disease because of compensatory uh, physiology that occurs with structural kidney disease. And then orthostatic proteinuria, which typically occurs in children and young adults where you see a discrepancy in uh, proteinuria in the orthostatic position. Uh, so basically, if you do a first morning uh, ACR, it would look relatively normal. If you do it at the end of the day, you would see proteinuria. And this is because of postural changes in proteinuria, and it's poorly understood, but is typically a benign finding that needs to just be followed. So why do we care about proteinuria? Um, it's quite marked that Albuminuria predicts the risk of progression of CKD, cardiovascular risk and mortality, as well as all-cause mortality. Also because albuminuria is an early marker of kidney disease and can predate any changes in the GFR. We know that the degree of albuminuria is also important and that there's a continuous positive relationship between urine albumin excretion and adverse outcomes. And I'll show you a graph of that. The risk of adverse cardiac outcomes with albuminuria is independent of traditional cardiac risk factors like dyslipidemia or smoking. So in and of itself appears to be a risk factor outside of the confounders. So this is a graph uh, 
uh, based on an article from The Lancet that shows the relationship between all-cause mortality and ACR and cardiovascular mortality and ACR. So you see that it's largely a linear relationship. And when it comes to progression of CKD, uh, this uh, Jason paper looked at the mils uh, per minute per 1.73 meters squared or the GFR change in patients who had normal, i.e. normal uh, ACR, a mild change in their ACR or heavy, what they called was, which was roughly an ACR above 30, which I'm sure you see all the time. They had quite a dramatic difference in the amount of uh, decline. So you can see in this group, some of them were dropping close to four or five uh, mils per minute per year, uh, whereas those with less proteinuria were really changing quite uh, a lot slower, uh, as highlighted here. And that sort of evidence, and there's many observational studies that show similar findings, has brought this KDGO uh, prognostication uh, table, which you may have seen before, where in this table, red represents very high risk of progression, orange is at high risk, yellow is at moderate risk, and green is at lower risk. And so a patient with a uh, normal GFR, but an ACR above 30, is considered in this to have the same prognostic category as patients with GFR of 30 to 44 without albuminuria. But I think the important thing to stress uh, on this is that these are not the only important risk factors for progression. So the cause of their kidney disease, the pattern of their change over time. So if somebody's being very stable over time, that's another good prognostic risk factor. And their response to treatment is also important. But this can be a helpful thing in terms of explaining to patients. In addition to a tool that's the kidney failure risk equation, which can be found on, uh, online. So another reason that we care about albuminuria is, is that it predates the GFR decline in diabetic nephropathy. So we see in this graph that in the purple line, we see the GFR. In the blue line, we see albuminuria. And we see this period, classical period in diabetes of hyperfiltration where the GFR actually goes up. And in that time frame, we have a window uh, perhaps to change things. And then we see in the blue here, rising albuminuria over time time from normal to microalbuminuria, as we used to call it, and to albuminuria, and then a decline in GFR. And this is the natural history that we see in most, but not all patients with diabetic nephropathy. So I thought it would be important to give you a general approach. So the first step in when you see somebody with uh, proteinuria is to rule out transient proteinuria with a repeat measurement. So I'd suggest that you repeat in one to two weeks or later another uh, value before you know interpreting that somebody truly has proteinuria. So this is really important because we see this all the time. The second step is to look for renal dysfunction or an active urine sediment. And this is important in terms of risk stratification of the, uh, the need for nephrology involvement. So checking their creatinine and GFR and their urine uh, microscopy uh, and dip is very helpful. And there's something called an active sediment that we talk about in nephrology, but for, for the purposes of deciding on whether something is more concerning or not, you can think of this as things like dysmorphic red cells or red cell casts, but really any unexplained hematuria with renal dysfunction and proteinuria is gonna be more worrisome. The next step is to quantify the proteinuria so spa assays are okay. As I mentioned, there's not a lot of role for 24-hour urines in primary care. The next thing to consider, and you all know your patients well, is what are the risk factors for proteinuria and CKD in your patients? So things like diabetes, which are commonly screened for, but also asking and thinking about whether or not your patients have signs or symptoms of a systemic disease like lupus or myeloma, chronic infections like hepatitis or HIV whether they're on any new medications or nephrotoxins, whether they have a history of hypertension. But in children or young adults, this um, entity of orthostatic proteinuria can be assessed with split urine tests or nephrology referral. At this point, if you identify some of these potential causes, you could consider adjunct lab tests based on these risk factors. So there's certain tests that always get done 
um, for patients being referred for urea once they get to a nephrologist that could be done um, like A1Cs, SPEPs, tests for chronic infections like hepatitis and HIV. And at that point, deciding on the need for a nephrology referral. So the guidelines do vary, uh, whether you look at the Canadian guidelines or the KDGO guidelines, which are international guidelines, on what is the degree of proteinuria that requires a uh, nephrology referral. So the Canadian guidelines talk about uh, you're in ACRs over 60, whereas the KDGO guidelines look at over 30. And I think a lot of the, you know, the difference between these two kind of depends on whether or not you think this proteinuria is explained or not. So if you have a patient who has long-standing diabetes uh, that's been poorly controlled and you have an ACR that's 28 and now it's 32, you may not be surprised and may not warrant as urgent of a referral as somebody who uh, has other findings, no diabetes, no hypertension, but now has new rheumatological symptoms. The other uh, indications which you're probably familiar with, GFR less than 30, and this should be persistent as we define CKD as an abnormal uh, creatinine, proteinuria, or structural kidney disease that lasts more than three months. Or if there's an active urine sediment, as I mentioned, unexplained hematuria, non-resolving API, progressive CKD, any persistent electrolyte disturbance, refractory, a hypertension or hereditary kidney disease, kidney disease like polycystic kidney disease or alports. But the things for more urgent referral that are commonly seen are rapidly deteriorating renal function and, and nephrotic syndrome. So that's when we have proteinuria over three or three and a half grams, hypoalbuminemia, sorry, less than 30, edema and hyperlipidemia. Um, or just nephrotic range proteinuria in itself, declining renal function in the presence of systemic disease or active urine sediment. And if you're not sure what fits in, you can you know, ask us. Uh, most nephrology offices have an urgent uh, referral triage process where patients can be seen within a couple weeks. So if you indicate that a referral is urgent, um, then it will be looked at right away. If we feel based on the information that we've received that it's not urgent, then we'll let you know um, and you can always give us a call. Um, obviously, the uh, across the province, there's some differences in terms of access to nephrology. Um, and so in, in some cases, some of these patients um, that have complex comorbidities and milder uh, changes may uh, be followed by an internist if there's no nephrologist. There are other referral guidelines that you can find, for example, on the KDGO uh, 2012, which are similar to what I stated, where it gives you kind of an idea. Perhaps in some cases, you may just monitor the patient over time with blood work um, and periodic urine ACRs to decide on their response to management. So in terms of the treatment of proteinuria, the most important thing is that the treatment should be aimed at the underlying disease process process, not just at the proteinuria itself. So if somebody has diabetes, the priority is glycemic control. If a patient has lupus, we may not treat them at all with traditional antiproteinuric medications in some cases. They may just require immunosuppressive medications. It depends on the, on the case. And similarly, and, fr and frustratingly, I'm sure to you all, is that the blood pressure control targets vary. Uh, so you know, in the majority of patients, less than 140 on 90 is recommended, for example, by CHEP, but for diabetic patients, less than 130 on 80. But you may see that for patients that have proteinuria, because some of our nephrology guidelines are different than these CHEP guidelines, we may suggest lower targets. And of course, we can't exclude the SPRINT trial, which changed, uh, sort of put a caveat in the CHEP guidelines to suggest that for patients who are non-diabetic, but at high, higher cardiac risk, and we're able to tolerate lower blood pressures, you may want to individualize it to them and discuss the risks and benefits, as they did see a trend towards more acute kidney injury in the lower target group in that trial. And importantly, that was not a, uh, a diabetic population. So in terms of what we call antiproteinuric agents, you're all familiar with ACE inhibitors and ARBs as it 
first line treatment for proteinuria, but it's important to think about, you know, what, what the mechanism of why these things would work. And we do not, not recommend uh, at all in any circumstance combining ACE inhibitors and ARPs uh, because there was uh, significant harm without benefit in the trial, such as on target trial. So if your blood pressure uh, and your patient is not at target, then just add a different agent and just lowering the blood pressure on its own can have an antiproteinuric effect. So it doesn't always have to be the ACE inhibitor that that's the only thing that helps. So there is a bit of controversy, however, in patients that have no high blood pressure, no diabetes, but have some albuminuria, especially when the ACR is less than 30. In this group, this ACR may indicate more of a cardiovascular risk factor than something that we need to treat specifically. So focusing on their lipid control, their low salt diet and their lifestyle may be the most important thing. Um, with that being said, it needs to be individualized based on the patient. So we may have, for example, a patient who has polycystic kidney disease who doesn't have hypertension um, by traditional measures or, or diabetes that we may treat differently or somebody with a glomerular disease. But for primary care, for patients with low degrees of albuminuria, for example, an ACR of eight with no hypertension or no, no diabetes, um, we don't have evidence to, to suggest that those patients need to be treated with ACEs or ARBs. Um, this should be looked at on an individual basis and you may just want to monitor the patient. So as I mentioned, cardiovascular risk factor modification is important and that's sort of something you're well aware of. Smoking cessation is also important. There is a, um, a kidney disease that can develop from smoking, which looks a lot like diabetic nephropathy as well. So what are the common pitfalls? So the number one uh, pitfall um, that we see is, is not repeating blood work after ACE inhibitor or ARB initiation. So you sh should always check light seria creatinine one week after initiation or upon dose up titration. Um, if you do see hyperkalemia that develops where the creatinine rises more than 30%, I would suggest that you stop the medication and repeat the blood work. But if you just see mild changes that can be uh, expected, less than 30% uh, rise, um, that doesn't rise further on repeat testing or just mild hyperkalemia, patients in that case can be educated on low potassium diet uh, and monitored. In some cases, you may get a benefit from uh, diuretics, uh, you know, like thiazide diuretics or loop diuretics to help with potassium excretion if they have other indications for those medications, or potassium binders are sometimes used in, in the case where we feel an ACE inhibitor or ARB is, is very important to be used, um, but they have hyperkalemia, but that depends on the, the situation. Uh, the second pitfall is up titrating an ACE inhibitor or an ARB during a period of renal decline or clinical instability. So I uh, want to emphasize that it's not always appropriate to initiate an ACE inhibitor or ARB prior to seeing a nephrology consult. Um, these benefits that we see from ACE inhibitors and ARBs come over months to years. And so uh, in cases where the kidney function is not stable, the risk of acute kidney injury or worsening their kidney uh, function with initiation of these agents is there. Um, so this is short-term harm. There's really no rush for initiating these medications in almost all cases from a nephrology perspective. Um, so if someone you're seeing their creatinines 1, 110, 130, 140, 190, 200, 220 over a period of time, just have them see a nephrologist and then decide. Um, and certainly don't up titrate in a period where the kidney function is, is declining on a rapid sense. Um, one thing that I think we all could do better, primary care and specialists, is giving sick day advice to patients to hold medications when they're unwell. So there are a myriad of medications that when patients are volume deplete can contribute to AKI risk. Um, so ACE inhibitors, ARBs, diuretics, metformin, which can cause lactic acidosis, and the new kid on the block, SGLT2 inhibitors, all risk, increase risk of AKI. So I do give patients handouts. There's one on the BC Renal Agency website, which you basically indicate 
which are the medications that they should stop if they're vomiting, diarrhea, um, unable to keep fluids down, uh, and what to do when to restart the medication. Um, so I think, you know, we see all the time in hospital patients that want to do right by their physicians and continue to take their medications diligently, even if they can't get out of bed. Um, and by, you know, impairing their autoregulation in the states of volume depletion, they can really get quite bad kidney injury. You know, there's different evidence on how well things like handouts work, but I think we can just do our best to really emphasize that, the, again, these medications uh, benefits are long term and short term holding of these medications is, is not a big deal. The next pitfall is missing aggravating factors of proteinuria. So, high salt diet can really get in the way of your ACE inhibitors or ARBs from working. So, low salt diet is important for patients with proteinuria. Sleep apnea is very common, as you all know but it actually can worsen not just hypertension, but proteinuria in and of itself. And we've seen this for patients who have sleep apnea and then are treated with CPAP therapy that we see in a reduction in their proteinuria. Uh, NSAID use would be another factor. Um, again, when you have somebody who has slowly, slowly progressive CKD, you don't need to stop their ACE inhibitor or ARB. Now, when you get to lower TFRs, closer monitoring is required. And at some point you'll often see us stop the ACE inhibitor or ARB when their GFR gets quite low, say less than 15 or so, so that maybe they get some degree of improvement in their kidney function to delay initiation of dialysis or transplantation. Um, but this isn't something that is necessarily GFR dependent of when you can use an ACE or an ARB. That being said, there is an ongoing trial that's called STOP ACE, and that trial is looking at that very question of whether or not it is helpful to stop um, with uh, more advanced CKD. Again, um, we still think there may be a benefit for some patients, but it, uh, it does depend on, back to that slide, it does sort of depend on what their protoplasm is. So if we're seeing patients that are having uh, quite substantial fluctuations in their kidney function or recurrent acute kidney injuries, it's really not worth any of the benefits and the, and the risks far away in that case, in which case we would just leave them off those agents and use alternate agents for blood pressure. In terms of treatment targets, this does really depend on the etiology. Um, most of the evidence, of course, comes from diabetic nephropathy and in the observational evidence, anyhow, when we do reduce proteinuria with treatment, it does appear to slow progression of CKD, but that's observational evidence, again, mostly from diabetes. We don't really know if proteinuria reduction in other disease states like diabetic, uh, non-diabetic CKD is as important because the mechanism is different and the medications may not work in the same way. So it's hard to come up with this specific target that um, you could follow. But the CSN does have a guideline to aim for you. You're an ACR of less than 40. But the bottom line is that ideally we want to reduce the ACR as low as possible, but we don't want to cause adverse effects. And we don't want to forget about other targets. So even if we see we're not able to get the ACR down or, or maybe it is down, we still need to think about our blood pressure targets. Of course, the stability of their kidney function and their EGFR and their other cardiovascular risk factors. In terms of preventative strategies, by the time uh, patients see a nephrologist, we know they've already had end organ complications of their disease, whether it be diabetes or hypertension or a systemic disease. But primary care has an important role in screening and treating early disease states to mitigate progression of disease. So, it's recommended that these high-risk groups be screened for CKD in primary care. I'm sure this is familiar to all of you, that hypertensive and diabetic patients, but also patients with heart failure, other vascular disease, um, unexplained anemia, uh, family history of end-stage renal disease, and then certain high-risk groups uh, are recommended as for the recent uh, guidelines to screen uh, First Nations peoples. In terms of future directions, you know, proteinuria, as we mentioned, it, it really is a biomarker of kidney disease and adverse outcomes. 
but it's unclear and so far it has been disappointing in terms of other biomarkers that could detect and predict CKD progression better than what we have now. So everything has been a little bit disappointing so far, but stay tuned for tests that would actually be available and affordable and useful in our clinical practice. We don't really have anything like that right now, apart from the things that we've mentioned so far. In terms of other uh, advances, there are uh, new antiproteinuric agents, if we could call them that. So it seems that the SGLT2 inhibitors, or we call the flozins, seem to have promising renal outcomes, including reduction of albuminuria and improvement in cardiovascular endpoints. I'm sure you've all heard a lot about these drugs. Um, but interestingly, they're now being studied uh, in more detail in CKD populations, both in patients with diabetes and actually also patients without diabetes uh, and kidney disease. So we may see um, some things coming down the pipeline for that, but I'm already seeing a big change in terms of the patients getting referred from primary care, a lot more patients being on these medications. And that, again, just I'd mentioned the caveat about the risk of acute kidney injury and the caution with the use of multiple medications, which all predispose to acute kidney injury. So in conclusion, proteinuria is not a disease, it's a marker of kidney disease. It's important to find out the why. There is some evidence, however, that albuminuria in itself can cause renal damage, which is an, another important fact to know. And we've already mentioned, I've shown you the data that albuminuria is associated with bad outcomes, so cardiovascular disease, mortality, and end-stage renal disease. So far, we think that if we improve albuminuria, it will improve outcomes, but we need more information on that. But we need to focus, and I really want to emphasize the cardiovascular risk factor reduction. As the majority of patients with early stage CKD will not progress to end stage renal disease, but will die prior to that of cardiovascular disease. So when we see uh, the number of patients that actually make it to end stage disease, renal disease, it's actually small. And that's because of other complications. Although the uh, incidence of end stage renal disease has gone up in part by good management, of these risk factors. Uh, so they don't have the heart attack or they get treated for the heart attack and then they make it to dialysis. So that's all I had um, for today. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have them on the monitor. Um, otherwise, uh, feel free to email me um, with any questions or comments. Um, I'll just wait for a minute or so to see if there's any questions that come through. If there's no other questions, I'd encourage you to look at the BC Renal Agency website, which has a lot of great resources um, for primary care. The uh, Canadian Society for Nephrology or CSN website also has some resources about referral patterns. And in fact, I have uh, a supplemental slide here, um, which is probably quite helpful um, in terms of uh, something to follow for patients at high risk of chronic kidney disease in your practice and, and when to refer. So this is found on the CSM website. All right, take care. <laughs>